Our reading this morning comes from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. It's a, uh, a wonderful, long story because it, it includes so much. Hear now this reading from John as we uh, enjoy the fruits of pretzel, pretzels passing through the pews. As he just walked along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, uh, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which uh, that, that means sent, to be sent. Then he went and washed and he came back and he was able to see. And the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, isn't this the old man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. And others were saying, no, but it must be someone like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, well, then how were his eyes opened? He answered them, the man called Jesus made mud, and he spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and I washed and I received my sight. And they said to him, well, where is he? And he said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, it was Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and he opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight, and he said to them, well, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, well, how can a man who is a sinner perform signs like this? And they were divided. And so they said again to the blind man, what did you say about him? Is, it was your, what do you say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. And he said, I say, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind, the, the Jewish authorities there, did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called his parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see now? But his parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Pharisees, for the Pharisees had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they call the man who had been blind, and they say to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he said, I, I don't know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I... I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, Well, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opens my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you, you were born entirely in sin and you, you, you're trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Now Jesus heard that they had driven the man out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy answered, Who is that, sir? Tell me so I can believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him. You have seen him. 
and the one speaking with you is he. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see. And those who see, do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said of him, Surely we're not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have sin. But now that you say, you would have no sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. Here ends our reading for today. Let us pray. Lord, in all that we talk about, all that we worry and work over in our heart and in our heads, may we be opened to see your grace. May you make us the very vision that you hope and hold in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this is the open and shut case. This is the open and shut case of those who are opened and those who are closed down. In this story, you have got it all. You have got drama. You have got healing. You have got antagonism. And you have got a story of grace that comes right through. John, the, the, the author here, portrays the Jesus who is wandering through the world doing the good he does. In the presence of God, you can see that things open up. Things crack that had been immovable, they suddenly become possible. And in here you have, for the first century world, one of the uncrackable, immovable problems. If you were born blind, it was not only a physical ailment, but it was considered a judgment on all of your ancestors. Something had gone terribly wrong in your heart, not just your optical cortex. You had, in some way, been so offensive to God that God would punish you with life, but life diminished. Life that did not allow you to see or do anything on your own. You were entirely dependent on the kindness of strangers and family. You could never be the support to your parents that you were expected to be. You were weakened in every aspect of being a full human. It would be impossible for you and your family to arrange a marriage contract. It would be impossible for you to simply go into the market and buy your own food. It would be impossible for other people in that culture not to see you as both pitiable but also probably at fault. You must have done something. And so the question from the disciples, Jesus, who sinned? This guy or his parents? Was this something that he did or something that happened in his ancestry? And Jesus says, no. You all are blind to what's going on here. This whole story is about the blindnesses of everybody in, the, in the, uh, all the characters. Everybody's blind. They, you've got the characters actually physically blind. You have the disciples who are blind to any possibility except what they've already been told. And you have the Pharisees in a similar situation, blind to the possibility that God might be doing a new thing, that God might have the capacity to show grace, and that you could subvert the idea that somebody had to be at fault. Also blind to the goodness that came out of it. Do you notice that not once, not anywhere, not in this whole long passage, which is nearly the entire chapter, not once does any Pharisee actually say, oh my God, what a wonderful thing. Someone blind can see. No, every one of these ones who are so concerned, they're like, well, well who authorized this? Who signed off on this? Did you sign off on this? Is this your doing? Did you do this? What about you? I don't think he was blind. That's what I think. I don't think it's possible. I think he's trying to cheat us. Not a single one here thought the possibility that God might have done a graceful mercy was possible. Sadly, I think there are ways in which we ourselves 
are too often those guys. We are too often, too often ready to, to make sure that everything is authorized by the right people, namely the people who think and act and believe just like me or you, and less concerned with the grace and miracles that are happening. We want to know that it was done by the right people rather than that the right thing happened. We are slow to admit to grace in miracles that occur through the actions, perhaps, of people we don't know, people we don't like, people we don't want to like, people we don't want to know. And there is the open and shut case. If we focus more on who it is that does it, we inevitably build silos for our thought. We inevitably surround ourselves with only people who think just like us. And we inevitably start to dismiss the good that God might be doing in others. I think it's one of the reasons that Jesus sent the disciples out. You know, they, uh, it's always interesting to me that the disciples did not form a college, build a hall, and go inside and teach each other stuff. Nothing personal about colleges, just saying. But Jesus said to them, you have to go out to the people. Go talk to the villages. Go into the highways and byways. Go out in twos. Two is more than one, but it's a lot less than in a whole other village. You got to go and be the vulnerable ones so that you have to listen. And you should be on the lookout for what God is doing. Open your eyes to what God is doing around you. Don't be so sure that you're the only agent of grace. Well, now I'm preaching to me. Now I'm preaching to myself. Now I'm, I've gone to meddling. Because it is much easier to keep track of your own agency. It's much easier to know that you're going to get a warm reception. It's much easier to know that the good that you see being done is done by people you know to be good. That's easy. That's good Christianity. It's not that that's a problem, but it's simple Christianity. It is simple discipleship. You want to take the next step? You've got to open your eyes. You've got to become open to the possibilities in others. You've got to become blind to your prejudices. This is the story that John weaves for us here with Jesus and this poor man who desperately is just trying to describe his experience, and nobody, but nobody, is believing him. They're all talking around him. He's in the same room. They're like, well, this man's not born blind. Well, I'm not sure he was born blind. He's like, I'm right here. I'm right here. Hello? I'm, right I'm the one who was born blind. I'm the one who can see. I'm the one who's rejoicing. And they're like, you can't rejoice. It was on a Sabbath. No rejoicing on a Sabbath. That's out. That is not approved. You been a killjoy ever in your life? You ever, ever thrown a wet blanket on somebody? Ever, uh, ever kind of tried to blunt or blind somebody else's joy because you did not approve? It did not happen in the right way? Yeah, all of us. The story of this guy, of course, is his eyes are opened. He's witnessing again. He's telling the truth like we talked about last week. You know, the only one who was willing to, to speak was the Samaritan woman, right? She goes and does what the disciples doesn't, don't. She goes out and tells people, I think this is the guy. And he comes back and they're like, are you blaspheming? Do you think he's Messiah? He's like, I don't even know who you're talking about. I was blind, remember? I couldn't see him. I don't know who he is. So when Jesus asks, there's this great humor. He says, you know, do you believe in the Son of Man? He says, I don't know. Who is that? And Jesus says, it's me. I'm the one. And recognizing the voice and seeing the face, he's, he's, he's converted. Not in, that, not in that funny, stereotypical way, but literally every atom of his soul is changed. His perspective, his sight line is different now. For us too, when we get into the presence of the Lord, I think that's what happens to us. Our sight lines can shift. If we have been closed, we can be open. 
And if we have been too open and run through by the world's stabbing light of too bright a dawn, we can, in fact, become blind to those things that have wounded us, taking with us those things that have made us strong. The Pharisees standing around say, he didn't mean us when he said we're blind, did he? Did he, did he mean us? He didn't mean me. I mean, you know, those other people are blind. Yeah, they're blind. I'm not blind. And Jesus says this is, in fact, the first sin. This may be the first sin. This may be the very number one out there, right? Which is pretending somehow that you are not human. Pretending that sometimes you aren't asleep. Those who come in to any kind of therapeutic situation, whether it be physical or psychological or spiritual, you know who gets better, right? The ones who get better are the ones who say, I think I have a problem. I think, I think I'm not seeing straight. That's who gets better. It's the one who says, I think I'm ill. I don't feel well. I think I'm sick and goes to the doctor. That's who gets, that's who gets better physically. And it's the, it's the racist who suddenly looks around, who's been hateful to other people and say, you know, maybe um, I'm not sure my ideology is working. I just was treated with kindness by someone who ought to have hated me and I tried to hate them back and they didn't respond with hate, they responded with love and now that's just freaking me out. The one who gets better is the one who realizes that they can't see everything. So in this passage, we've got a case for community to keep each other accountable and loved, to feed each other with, with loving mercies and graces, but also to say there are a vast number of perspectives. Have you tried them all yet? Where do you go and what do you see if you stand in this person's shoes? And we have in this the hope, the hope that any person can change that very nature of their vision. Jesus doesn't cut off the Pharisees. He just says that as long as you completely believe that you have everything you need and that you are sufficient unto yourself and that you do not have any blindness in you, then your sin is stuck with you. Because if you are blind to the possibilities, then you are stuck with only what you can see yourself. And friends, it's not enough. It's never been enough. It's never been enough to just get what you need for you. It has never been a spiritual act to just get what you need for you, to just get what you need. It's important that you get what you need, but to just get what you need, that is sin. That is not salvation. It is blindness to others. Sometimes it is blindness to self. But it is always a closing off of possibilities that kills the human spirit. We are born of the water and blood of Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is the breath that blew through the wilderness and created a world. Seas and oceans, skies and clouds, stars and little fish. All of this creativity cannot be dammed up in the human soul. We have, too, to see more. We, too, yearn to create. We, too, yearn to be in connection and community with one another, in right relationship with self, with others, with God. And when we're not, it's sort of an open and shut case. We don't thrive. We wound others. We hurt and we end up hurting those around us. You can blow that up to the size of an entire nation where our major concern, perhaps in narrow self-interest, is ripping us apart at the seams and sometimes where there weren't seams before, we are tearing new ones. Or you can take it right down to your own heart and what you'll be doing this afternoon. Isolated from your community, separated from those miracles and blessings. How long do you think any of us last without sinking into either fear or depression 
or anxiety or anger. All of the things that Paul talks about in Ephesians are not just about sexual immorality or drinking too much. Some of the things that wound us most deeply, the, the, the things that are unfruitful works, are the results of our closed eyes, full speed ahead, I don't care who I run over, thoughts and attitudes. If you're going to run through this world, open your eyes. If you're going to reach out to others, be awake, Paul says. Be awake. Be children of the light. Be children of the light. The light, let it flood into you. And then, as Paul says, when you let the light in, you become light. That wonderful lightness of being. That wonderful projection of light to others. On this fourth Sunday, you'll notice that we we always read the 23rd Psalm, where there is a psalm about provision in the midst of trouble. That 23rd Psalm can be sung with exuberance or it can be whispered in the darkness of your despair. It can be shouted from a mountaintop. The Lord is my shepherd and I need nothing. I've got it all. But in the middle of that psalm is the reminder that even in the valley of the shadow of death, light shines. Let's never be so haughty as to ignore the light when it comes. Let's never be so arrogant as to think that we're the only ones who can carry it or see it. And let us never be so stingy and so greedy as to keep light from others, by either by locking it away inside ourselves but never telling of it, or by standing in front of somebody else's and blocking it from reaching the people to whom it was intended. The Lord is my shepherd. And sometimes the shepherd says, get out the way. And sometimes the shepherd says, look over there. Do you see that green field? This day, we have a lot to meditate on terms of openness and blindness. Eyes wide shut is how we often go through life. Wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be nice to open your eyes and see the mercy and love intended not just for you, but for everyone?